the Brexit bill and a plan to reboot Britain, but can Boris Johnson deliver? My government's priority is to deliver the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union on the 31st of January. I do not think it vainglorious or implausible to say that a new golden age for this United Kingdom is now within reach. It was the second Queen's speech in two months and after last week's historic election. Didn't the looks just say it all? Well, the government's new agenda includes protected higher spending on the NHS and a crackdown on foreign spies. But as the announcements are being made, Nicola Sturgeon was on her feet launching her bid for a second independence referendum for Scotland. Robert will join us shortly. Also on News at 10 tonight. Article 1 is adopted. The impeachment of only the third US president in history. Today, Trump hit back. I don't feel like I'm being impeached because uh, it's a hoax, it's a setup, it's a horrible thing they did. Australia burns a state of emergency as the temperatures break record after record with fires which won't go out and a dream put on ice since he was a boy, the 92-year-old who finally got his chance to go skiing. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. It was exactly a week ago that we started to get our first indication of the scale of Boris Johnson's majority. Well, today he confirmed what he was going to do with it. Yes, getting Brexit done, and that work starts again tomorrow in the Commons. But Mr Johnson also followed through on his campaign promise to cement extra spending on the NHS in England. There was more, of course, 29 bills in all. A cut to business rates, legal protection for military veterans, new rules on immigration, on foreign spies and tougher sentences for terrorists, delivering on the people's priorities, Mr Johnson called it. In reply, the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn said he feared those who'd been swayed by the Prime Minister's promises would be sorely disappointed. If you wanted to know what Britain's unwritten constitution looks like, this is it. A monarch and her son on their way to the throne in the Palace of Westminster to open Parliament. And there was the victor, Boris Johnson, about to reveal how he'll use his unassailable 80-seat majority. While the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, humiliated in that election, just couldn't see the funny side of any of it. My government's priority is to deliver the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union on the 31st of January. My ministers will bring forward legislation to ensure the United Kingdom's exit on that date. That election was mostly about getting Brexit done, and the Queen confirmed it's on course. But the election was also about the lamentable health of the National Health Service. For the first time, the National Health Service's multi-year funding settlement, agreed earlier this year, will be enshrined in law. Other measures in a relatively substantial roster of promises were a new law to control immigration, especially the flow of people to the UK with lower skills, reform of social care for the elderly to include more money and talks with other parties to put in place a whole new system, investment in transport, broadband and reducing carbon emissions or around £100 billion over five years of infrastructure spending and legislation to make sure terrorists and the most violent criminals remain longer in prison. Another part of the great tradition is that a backbencher, in this case the Tory Tracy Crouch, opens the big debate and she couldn't resist a bit of seasonal teasing of last week's big loser. Old Marley sits on the front bench opposite, chained and regretful. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just about Arsenal's recent performance. <laughs> Smile, Jeremy, <laughs> won't kill you. <laughs> As for Jeremy Corbyn, he's still clutching at small victories in that massive defeat. In this Queen's speech, the government has tried to mimic some of the priorities and, interestingly, much of the language of Labour policies, but without the substance. On austerity, on investment, on regional inequality, on the National Health Service, we can see how we forced the terrain to shift. 
They say, Mr Speaker, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, even if it's very pale imitation. Now, Boris Johnson isn't known for self-deprecation, but even by his standards... I do not think it vainglorious or implausible to say that a new golden age for this United Kingdom is now within reach. And, and in spite of the scoffing, in spite of the negativity, in spite of the scepticism that you will hear from the other side, we will work flat out to deliver it. After the dither, after the delay, after the deadlock, after the paralysis and the platitudes, the time has come for change and the time has come for action. And it is action that the British people will get from this gracious speech, this most gracious speech, and I commend it to the House. Johnson is now properly settled in here. His majority is so big that the former Chancellor, Philip Hammond, says he has a parliamentary dictatorship with the power to transform the country in more or less whatever way he likes. Robert Peston, News at 10. Well, with that big majority, the Prime Minister believes that, like Brexit, there is other controversial legislation that he can now get through Parliament. Hence, he's making good on his commitment to protect military veterans from prosecutions, which the government says are brought simply to rekindle old conflicts. Well, our pol pol political correspondent, Carl Dinan, is outside the Ministry of Defence this evening in a big focus on defence and security today, Carl. That's right. We learned today that the Prime Minister himself will lead a much bigger review into defence, security and foreign policy than we'd been expecting. The most significant such exercise since the Cold War, we are told. And also, as you've mentioned, something ministers here at the MOD have been after for some time. A degree of protection from prosecution for, our, for service personnel and veterans who've served in places like Iraq, Afghanistan and Northern Ireland. Something that will be legally difficult to do and also, particularly in Northern Ireland, deeply controversial. On the security front, there will also be a crackdown on what the government calls hostile state activity, spying and other such activities here in the UK with probably a whole new Official Secrets Act and also perhaps a foreign agents registration scheme, which means that anyone working for a state like Russia would have to declare it. Any spies who are later caught who haven't done that would therefore be easier to deport. All this, of course, aimed at Russia, about whom the Prime Minister has been deeply critical at times. Although, speaking in Moscow today, the Russian President, Vladimir Putin, was much more conciliatory towards Mr Johnson. Оказался победителем, и он тоньше чувствовал, чем его политические противники, настроение в британском обществе. Поэтому победил и... But despite those conciliatory words from the Russian president, make no mistake, Julie, the threat that most of this action today is aimed at countering is the Russian one. OK, Carl, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, after so much about the NHS during the election campaign, the Prime Minister had to make good on his funding promises today. His commitment to write future spending increases into law will give health service managers certainty, but the money will not, according to the Doctors' Union, the British Medical Association, make up for years of underinvestment. And while there was a billion more for social care, there was no long-term plan other than to work on one with other parties. He wanted us to believe he cared about the NHS. Boris Johnson spent much of the election campaign telling patients he's on their side. Now he's putting his money where his mouth is, by writing in law a commitment to invest nearly £34 billion over the next five years. That money can't come soon enough for Heather Eady. This morning she visited Bedford Registry Office to collect her mother's death certificate. Three weeks before she died, she'd had a fall and had to wait four and a half hours for an ambulance. I couldn't believe how long it took and I couldn't believe how slow the time went. Every time I looked at my watch, I thought, oh, it's only been another half an hour, but surely they're going to come soon because she's an old lady. The extra £34 billion a year for the NHS in England is an average year-on-year -year increase of 3.4% by 2024. 
That's double the average spent since the Tories came to power in 2010. But it's still way below the average yearly increase in spending of 5.5% during the new Labour years. It's why many field services simply aren't coping. Today, figures reveal on average hospitals are at 95% occupancy, dangerously high. Many leading experts believe money for day-to-day -day services just isn't enough. We need to see some clear plans for reforming the social care system, both the level of funding and the, the way in which social care is, is delivered, um, that are fair and transparent and consistent across the country, and we haven't yet seen the detail on that. This is Isabel. Oh, Elizabeth. Hello. Providing social care in the home is crucial to help keep patients like Charlotte out of hospital. But years of cuts have led to a service that can't always meet patients' needs. When they see us, it's like a light. You know, they're coming, they're here, you know, they're here to help me, so they're happy. Would you like more time to spend with them? Yeah, I do, but it's, uh, obviously this is why I'm saying, you see, we have, like, time limit, you see, because we don't get the time sometimes that we need with the client. I wish they come and they stay with me for the whole day, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> they have to go to some another client. This government is telling us it is listening. What matters, though, is whether it also delivers. Emily Morgan, News at 10. Well, if the Queen's speech was one result of last week's election, there was another in Edinburgh. Boyd, by claiming 47 of Scotland's 59 seats, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon set out her case for a second independence referendum. There was no mention of going to court to force one through, not yet. But it is an argument that is likely to run and run, while Boris Johnson keeps saying no. It is the season for gifts. Last week, voters gave the SNP a big election victory in Scotland. So today, just a short distance from Edinburgh's Christmas market, Nicola Sturgeon wrote to the Prime Minister with her wish, the power to hold a second independence referendum. Everybody in Scotland knows, the dogs in the street, to use the colloquial term, know there's going to be an independence referendum because you cannot stand in the way of the right of people of Scotland to choose their future. Um, I fully expect uh, today we'll get the flat no of Tory Westminster opposition, but that's not an end of the matter. Tonight she published her letter to Boris Johnson asking for the authority to call another referendum. In it she says the government had committed to engaging seriously with our proposals. You have a duty, she tells him, to do so in a considered and reasonable manner. Nicola Sturgeon believes the election last week has given her a clear mandate for what she calls Scotland's right to choose. But what she hasn't said is what she'll do if the Conservative government at Westminster keeps saying no. I think if you hold a referendum and you say to people, look, we're asking you to decide this issue, and once you've decided it, that's it for a generation, you should respect that. Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmon said that's what they would do. But Nicola Sturgeon says Brexit has changed everything. So will voters heed her call to rally round another vote? No, so last time, I don't trust. I don't trust that. the last time and they said no, so I no. don't see why we should have to repeat that again. No. If enough people here want it, I think we should go for it. Um, because it's our own choice what we want to do in our own country. There's been so many referendums, I think people are getting bored of it. And I want it, I would vote yes, but I just don't know how it's going to go down. Tonight, the Scottish Parliament passed a bill that could help pave the way to a second referendum. The motion is therefore agreed and the Referendum Scotland Bill is passed. But Nicola Sturgeon says for it to be legitimate, Westminster must give its blessing. She says the longer she has to keep asking, the easier her argument for independence will become in the new year. Ben Chapman, News at 10, Edinburgh. And as promised, Robert has joined us. We should look ahead to the withdrawal agreement bill tomorrow. A big moment and not with, without some significant changes to this, to this bill. That's right. And the first thing I'd like to point out is quite how humiliating what's going to happen tomorrow is for Labour and Northern Ireland's DUP. You'll remember that before the election, Theresa May and then Boris Johnson offered the Labour Party, for example... Employment on sorry protection on employment rights, environmental protections, a big role for Parliament to oversee or to give its view on what kind of future relationship we should have with the European Union. 
All of that has been stripped out by Boris Johnson. Why can he do that? Because he's got a massive majority. As for Northern Ireland's DUP, nor, uh, you know, Theresa May negotiated a deal that did not put a new border down the Irish Sea. Boris Johnson's deal has achieved something that the DUP hates, which is a border down the, North, you know, down, down the Irish Sea. The DUP and Labour, many would say, were bonkers not to support Brexit before the election, and now they're getting a form of Brexit that they hate. Now, what it tells us about Boris Johnson is he's got the numbers now to do literally whatever he likes. He will get that Brexit bill through. We will be leaving at the end of January, and he is mooting really radical changes to this country, a massive overhaul of the way we do defence, a massive overhaul of the relationship between courts... Parliament, the executive, reviews coming out of his ears that could genuinely transform this country. And the point is, he has got the numbers from that general election to do just that. That's been quite a week, Robert. Thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you. Now, the overnight impeachment vote in the United States was decisive enough for President Trump to be put on trial in the Senate, but today the political row switched to when that might happen. It had been pencilled in for next month, but now it looks like the Democrats are indulging in delaying tactics to create maximum discomfort for the president. He said tonight they'd done a horrible thing by impeaching him. You might expect this White House to be defensive, if not contrite. But instead, the freshly impeached president this afternoon appeared defiant and tantalised the country at what might lie ahead. And they cheapened the word impeachment. It's an ugly word, but they cheapened the word impeachment. Uh, that should never again happen to another president. And I think you'll see some very interesting things happen over the coming few days and weeks. At his side was Congressman Jeff Van Drew, a former Democrat who has just defected to the Republican Party. A small symbolic victory being leveraged for maximum political gain. May God bless America. Last night, the sense of political drama in the chamber was palpable. A Congress trying to rein in a president. What is at risk here? is the very idea of America. That idea holds that we are a nation of laws, not of men. We are a nation that believes in a rule of law. The nays are 190. Then the vote came, almost entirely along party lines. Article 1 is adopted. The, que the question is on... Look again at Speaker Pelosi, trying to suppress the cheers of Democrats. She did not want this to appear to be a gleeful moment. So having voted that the president had indeed abused his powers, the second article of impeachment on obstruction passed in complete silence. Article 2 is adopted. Today, the speaker claimed that Americans were almost joyful. Seems like people have a spring in their steps because the president was held accountable for his reckless behavior. No one is above the law. At the precise time that impeachment passed, Trump was addressing a rally in Michigan, predicting that Democrats had just guaranteed him re-election. This lawless partisan impeachment is a political suicide march for the Democrat Party. Have you seen my polls in the last four weeks? It meant that Americans witnessed an astonishing split-screen moment, an historic presidential rebuke being approved as he was punching the air with supreme self-confidence. President Trump even tweeted out this message, they're not after me, they're after you, reframing impeachment as an attack on patriotic Americans. The Republican leader of the Senate, where the trial of the president will take place, has now weighed in, mocking the articles of impeachment that the accusations themselves are constitutionally incoherent. Constitutionally incoherent. When the president returned to Washington late last night, it was already clear that he sees impeachment not as a source of shame, but of political advantage.
And Robert joins us from Washington. It seems extraordinary, Robert, that Donald Trump could actually exploit this situation to his own benefit. Yeah, we've always regarded, Julie, this as a, the president as a man who doesn't just sort of break the rules but crashes through them. But this is really taking it to an entirely uh, new level. It says something quite extraordinary about the sort of tribal nature of politics that perversely uh, Donald Trump is seeing impeachment almost as a badge of honour. He is fundraising from it. He yesterday saw $5 million pour into his uh, re-election campaign account and in many many ways this is the sort of the classic trump playbook he is so outraging so provoking his opponents that they are making misjudgments that he believes will antagonize centrist and independent voters i think ultimately we will only know the sort of the verdict of these tumultuous days the the political verdict that is uh, when it gets to november the 3rd 2020 and when the american people have spoken at the time of the next presidential election Robert, thank you. There's been a shooting in Moscow today, right on the doorstep of its main Secret Service headquarters. The FSB said one of its officers had been killed by an unidentified gunman and two security guards were badly wounded. The killer was then shot dead by an armed officer. The FSB gave no details about him nor his suspected motives other than to say he was acting alone. Now, every statistic about Australia's wildfires is staggering. The temperatures, for a start, another record was broken today, 41.9, a degree hotter than yesterday, and that isn't just for one hot spot. It is the average across the whole country. And then there is the number of fires, 100 in New South Wales alone. No wonder authorities there have declared a week-long state of emergency. In a week when Australia has seen its hottest ever recorded temperatures, the deadly bushfires march on. The village of Buxton, the latest to be consumed by the flames. Homes and businesses destroyed as the fires head in the direction of Sydney's outer suburbs. For those on the front line, there's little they can do. Everything, memories, a whole lot. You can't replace it, but at the end of the day, our lives are more important. We're here with pots and pans and we're just putting some water and protecting the home, so that's what you do for your mates. In New South Wales, they're fighting more than 100 fires. More intense heat and strong winds are forecast. Three firefighters were injured, two of them with serious burns. Sydney's skyline has been covered in a smoky haze. It's Harbour Bridge now shrouded as residents suffer from the effects. I can't breathe properly. My stomach, my chest, sort of feel a bit tight. In this surgery, doctors are dealing with the consequences of the poor air quality. Oh, probably one of the worst in the world at the moment. You know, with the, you, literally, because of the smoke, you can't see more than about 100 metres. Potentially fatal. I've had several patients with bad asthma have to be admitted to hospital. The flames have already claimed six lives, destroyed hundreds of homes and burned millions of hectares of land. Neil Connery, News at 10. Well, during every Australian summer, wildfires break out. This year, they started early after an exceptionally warm, dry winter. One explanation for the extreme heat down under could be a climate phenomenon called the Indian Ocean Dipole. Currently, it's in a positive phase, meaning sea surface temperatures are warmer in the west of the ocean and cooler in the east. The difference between these two temperatures is the sharpest in 60 years, leading to more rainfall and flooding in the west, places like East Africa, and much drier conditions in Southeast Asia and Australia. So dry, in fact, that the continent is baking in temperatures pushing 50 degrees in places. Well, our science editor, Tom Clark, has joined us to talk a bit about this. Now, how does climate change influence or relate to these natural variations in weather? It's a kind of fundamental question. I mean, despite all our talk of climate change, the biggest factor in the variation on our year-to-year -year climate are these phenomena that like you've just described, a dipole, or it's much bigger cousin, the El Nino event, which drags up much more heat from that much bigger ocean, the Pacific. And life on Earth has evolved to cope with these extremes. You know, the eucalyptus trees we see ablaze across New South Wales, they are, need fire to thrive and survive and reproduce. They've evolved to burn in a way. But 
beneath the swings and roundabouts of natural variation in the climate, we have global warming, pushing temperatures up as we put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The Met Office in the UK today forecasting 2020 is on track to be one of the warmest years on record, 1.1 degrees warmer than pre-industrial averages. And what's significant is 2020 is a year when there was no, is not predicted to be an El Nino year. The hottest year on record, 2016, strong El Nino. So what happens when we have this continued global warming plus these natural variabilities like a strong El Nino, severe weather events like we're seeing in Australia become very extreme weather events. And that's one thing that is concerning climatologists. OK, Tom, thank you very much for that. To an update now on the condition of the six-year-old French boy who was thrown from the Tate Modern Art Gallery in London in the summer. He was terribly badly injured and indeed is still in a very bad way. But his family say he has finally started to say short words again. He's also regained some sensation in his arms and legs. They thanked people for the donations to his treatment fund and for their messages of support. Now, ever since he won that general election a week ago and again today, Boris Johnson has promised to repay the trust former Labour voters put in him and his government. One of those constituencies that had been Labour since 1935 but was won by the Conservatives was Bassett Law in Nottinghamshire. So did the Prime Minister promise enough in today's Queen's speech to keep faith with his new blue voters? Eight and nine... 89. In workshop, it's only bingo they leave to chance. So in last week's election, many a hand might have hesitated over the ballot paper. But in the end, in this Labour town, one man's number came up. Boris's den, number 10. Yay! Brexit, of course, and Britain's borders, the winning numbers. Brexit. <laughs> If he can manage that on the 31st, and after all this time they've been uh, toying about with it, I think he'll have done a good job. Because England isn't England anymore. The town felt a long way from the pageantry of the Queen's speech today. Here they've struggled since King Cole was dethroned 30 years ago. Still the promise of tax breaks for pubs and high streets, even in the ex-miners club, where Labour loyalties run deep. That looked refreshing. Workshop used to be a thriving town, um, it, especially in this industry. I hope it'll make a massive difference. I hope Workshop gets back to the days that it used to be full. A decade of austerity to put right and the great expectations created by Brexit to meet. If Boris Johnson wants this newly Tory town to keep the faith, he'll have to do more than fix up the shops. At the local salon, they might offer to tidy the Prime Minister's unruly hair but their votes are on loan. Even his tough message on crime doesn't quite cut through. I just think it's got worse anyway. Knife crime's got worse. And you don't, the promise to throw away the key for violent criminals, you don't believe them? Yeah. Just I don't think anything will change. Do you have a problem trusting Boris Johnson and what he's promising? Um, I trust, I don't trust any of him. I don't no. trust any of him. Like a phoenix rising from the ashes of the mining industry, this engineering firm's success is proof Worksop can change. But a company dependent on tariff-free EU imports reckons its future and 150 jobs is still uncertain. It's a big shift moving from you know a staunch Labour community, seeing people vote Conservative. I firmly believe that that's down to the Brexit issue. Until we actually see a deal or no deal and the implications of that deal, um, we, we simply don't know. For the first Christmas in 90 years, this town has a Tory MP. But is Boris the gift who will keep on giving or is he only good for Brexit? John Ray, News at 10, works up. And finally, a boyhood dream was fulfilled today for Bob Trulock. The only thing is, his boyhood was a very long time ago. Well, Bob told me he wants to go whizzing down. <laughs> it was quite something then for him to have his first go at skiing at the age of 92, organised by his brilliant carers at his nursing home in Oxfordshire. And he apparently enjoyed it so much that he was soon heading back up to the top for another go, proving that you are never too old 
to try something new, which is good news all round. And that is News at 10 for tonight. I'll be back tomorrow with all the news on that Brexit vote, of course, and more, but from all of us on the News at 10 team. Good night.